So I would like to thank uh, Eduardo, Esperanza, for, and all the team uh, that organized this nice event and invited me to give uh, this talk. I, I hope my presentation will pop up soon. <laughs> okay, then we can start. And my yeah. pleasure to announce Luca and to first talk about today about the approaching certificates of models for plastic release state of transport. And most of you will know Luca already He's from Norway. And he's uh, from the uh, Research Institute for Water and Environment. He's quite well known with the um, community about plastics, also in the water, but also in the terrestrial environment. And he's also the leader of the Pavillon project, which is especially investigating the agriculture uh, plastic Yes. So, um, still waiting for my presentation. I want to. Philippe has just gone to start. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I can start. Uh, so the talk I give today is about uh, addressing uncertainties on uh, yeah environmental fake models for microplastics in landscapes. Um, yeah. Soil are main major recipient of uh, microplastic uh, pollution. About six, between 64% and 90% of all plastic found in the ocean originates from land-based sources. Uh, unfortunately, lots of knowledge gaps uh, affecting the understanding of how plastic move from soil to water prevent an accurate assessment of exposure and eventually a risk of both terrestrial and aquatic environments. To address this knowledge gap, fake models, mathematical models of the transport and behavior of plastic uh, are useful tools. They can be used to address scarcity of data, for example. They can uh, enable comparison between data sets. We know how difficult it is to compare data across originated from different laboratories and analyzing different ways. They can be used to elaborate mass budget. Uh, and estimate present and future distribution and levels of contaminants, these contaminants in soil. Very recently, uh, the area of development of environmental fake models uh, for terrestrial environment has emerged. Why uh, for marine environment this has been going on for a while. Different approaches have been proposed. Uh, to model plastic fate and behavior in soil. One approach is the so-called multimedia box models. They generally focus on uh, defining a generic theoretical scenario, so an environment that is, doesn't have, a, it's not a real environment. It, it has a certain amount of soil in it, a uh, certain amount of fresh water, a certain amount of uh, air and, and seawater. And uh, based on theoretical knowledge we have, uh, they can uh, elaborate uh, distribution assessment of plastic in these totally theoretical models. They are useful assessment tools, and they can be elaborated even in absence of uh, uh, empirical data. They cannot be inherently thoroughly validated because they do not reflect the real environment. The second level is the data-driven models. This is, uh, on the other side, requires lots of data that are used to establish regression analysis that uh, produce this mathematical expression of uh, trends observing the environment. They are very useful to make sense of data, filling gaps. On the other side, they cannot be used as predictive tools because they are defined in a specific and a set of data. So they can be used to fill gaps from uh, specific data sets, but not to predict future trends. And finally, we have the mechanistic dynamic models. This is mainly the most sophisticated typology. They rely on an in-depth understanding of the physics and chemistry that drives the transport and behavior of particles in the environment. And so they require uh, this knowledge. They can be defined to reflect specific environment and specific points in time and space. Therefore, they can even be validated and calibrated and validated by comparing, you know, adapting and configuring them to, to a specific scenario where data are available and be challenged to predict empirical data. 
So this option has a uh, pros and cons. I don't have time to go through that. Uh, I try to summarize in these slides this this uh, these features. One important aspect when it comes to model is to address accuracy and precision. And this is a very important aspect, especially concerning microplastic model for which we have very little experience. So it's really some seminar work going on right now. I like to look at model as a sort of indirect measurement tools. What does it mean? Uh, let's imagine, for example, to plot uh, the likelihood of uh, producing a given estimate to a model against environmental concentration. So you see in the two axes here. You can ask a model to produce estimates of that environmental concentration by taking account all the uncertainty for the parameters. What the model return is most likely a distribution like this one, so with a certain probability you have a given estimate. And you may assume that the central tendency of this distribution is uh, as the best estimates. So we call it model most frequent estimates. It can also be called best estimates of the model. Once you have this distribution, you can even assess the precision of the model by looking at the variance of the distribution. And let's imagine that you have knowledge of the real environmental concentration. Okay? So in this case, you can assess a model accuracy if you know the difference between your best estimates and the real concentration. However, a thing like a real environmental concentration is not given to know. It's something that is totally virtual. The, the only way we have to, to know that concentration is through measurements. And we know that also measurements come with certain level of uncertainty, right? So uh, here, for example, is the distribution of a hypothetical set of measurements through replicates. You will have a different value. You can calculate the distribution. And you may assume that uh, your mean of measurements representing the closest proxy of the real environmental concentration. So models have to be compared to this uh, proxy obtained through uh, observation. For this reason, obviously, models can never be better than empirical observation. Okay? They offer other, other functions, other functionalities that are useful, but they cannot be better than measurements. We know that in the area of microplastic that uh, measurement comes with a great deal of uncertainties. Okay? This is a major problem. Uh, therefore, our understanding of what is the real environmental concentration is very blurred. Uh, I went through a review and I checked that there are some estimations. For example, when we measure uh, concentration in fresh water, in rivers, for example, measurement can have, uh, uh, let's say, a, a confidence boundary that varies between a factor of two around the median. For sediments, this is a factor of ten we can get, guess the order of magnitude of environmental concentration. Soil does not get uh, an assessment, but of course we know the soil are nasty, uh, compartment difficult to analyze, so we expect that this would be at the same level as uh, the sediment. So when addressing, checking, evaluating the performance of model, we need to remember that we are comparing model results with quite uncertain data from measurements. And this is a major limitation for the development of models. So there's no empirically assessed or calibrated mechanistic model of microplastic fate to date. We need to fill this gap by comparing models, these type of models with uh, measurements. It is difficult to model microplastic because there are non steady kind of uh, of uh, pollutants, so they do not reach equilibrium in the environment. They move driven by physical forces uh, dictated by meteorology, hydrology, and soil uh, physical and chemical structure. Uh, however, we need to be able to run models that can be confronted with this data. And this must be done through prepared to evaluate a mechanistic dynamic model that can predict real environmental scenarios. In other words, my presentation could have been titled Do Models on Microplastic Fate and Distribution Make Any Sense? Let's see. We asked this question and we elaborated a mechanistic model called INCA MP, Integrated Catchment Model 
for microplastic fate. This is a standard mechanistic model for describing fate of plastics in the environment, microplastic. It's driven by hydrology, so the model first has to predict the movement of water uh, in a landscape, and the model runs at catchment, at river catchment level, and can be set up to describe real catchment. It includes a lot of processes, so that goes uh, from soil erosion, runoff of particles, storage of particles in soil, um, the down, downstream transport of plastic in river, the exchange between sediment and particles, all these are affected by, driven by a physical uh, function that describes the physics of this transport. And the parameters affecting this, uh, uh, this transport are size and density of particles, but also intensity of rain, geomorphology, etc. Uh, as inputs, we have uh, included uh, the addition of microplastic to soil through the sewage slice treatment, an additional source to the soil, which we call ambient, and is uh, undefined, include atmospheric deposition or any other source originated from soil, for which we have no knowledge, and we ask the model to guess the value of that source. Concerning the water phase, we included uh, wastewater effluent for which we had measurements. We also had measurements for sewage sludge. And of course, river receive uh, plastic from the runoff calculated by, by the model land, uh, runoff from land. A uh, little bit of more detail, that's how the model basically works. The soil phase, the particles are present in two phases, uh, what we call mobile phase and immobile phase. Driven by water movement, the particles can infiltrate and move from the mobile phase to the immobile phase. Um, erosion of soil to what we call splash detachment affect the remobilization from the immobile phase to the mobile phase, and the surface runoff drives particles towards the water to something called transport capacity, which is also a parameter. All these parameters, we ask the model to calibrate to provide the best possible estimates of environmental data, empirical data. In the water, we have a settling, which is calculated through physics by calculating buoyancy and the terminal settling velocity and so on, which is a function of, of a water a kinematic viscosity. We have entrainment, which is the erosion of sediment that brings particles, which is a function of stream power, uh, stream velocity. Yeah, I already mentioned the input, sewage sludge. We had measurements plus this ambient unknown source for the soil and wastewater effluent that are not from land, from the water. Some key assumptions beyond this assumption about uh, the inputs. We started the same, we ran the model between the period of 2012 and 2019, so several years of simulation for a specific site that we'll tell you later which site. We included an initial amount of 200 tons of microplastic in soil, which coincided to 6 times 10 to the minus 5 percentage, percentage of microplastic in soil by mass, which is consistent with uh, what we know so far about the average concentration in soil measures mostly from Chinese studies. We assume that this land storage tend to increase over time. The, the mean annual concentration of plastic in soil tend to increase annually over time. And this is consistent with evidence from, for example, studies focusing on sewage large application, or repeated sewage large application that shows increasing concentration. We run simulation, bulk simulation for two categories of particles, fragments and fibers. The model can detail uh, a lot of processes. It can detail uh, simulation for classes of particles in size classes and, and density classes, but the data we had was not sufficiently dense to, to break it down in a higher level of detail. Also, the model accounts for processes such as heteroaggregation, fragmentation, biofilm formation. But again, the data we had was the evidence we had that we could compare the model with was not sufficient to get into this level of detail. So we bulk particles only in two classes, fragment and fibers. This is the model scenario is the Henares River catchment in Spain, growing close to Madrid, for which we had a measurement of uh, microplastic fragments and fibers in three points. We have a 
is the pointer. Three, this is the deep catchment. We have a small sub catchment here, another small sub catchment. This is mostly forested. This is a small agricultural sub catchment. This is the big, the big henares. So sorbet, party, and hen henares. Uh, we have uh, this concentration in three points at the, at the end of each sub catchment in water and sediment concentration collected three times in, in time, different times during the year. Uh, we also have data of sewage sludge application. We have measurements of microplastic in sewage sludge, dead sewage sludge. We have measured several wastewater effluent in this region, so to give the input. And of course, we have meteorological and hydrological data. So the first step to set up model running is to make sense of this information we have about inputs. Okay? As I said, when you measure sewage large or wastewater effluent, you get a great deal of variability in your measurements. These measurements uh, results are uh, depicted by the red uh, dots along, along the axis, right? Um, so we asked the model to take account of all these variabilities. So the first thing we did was to create a distribution that the model could use to randomly extract estimated values of those concentrations to define the inputs of plastic to the landscape. Okay? So and then we ran the model thousands of times with randomly extracted value of those inputs from those distributions. This is the way we objectively accounted for the variability. And we let the model running and calibrating itself in a fully automatic mode so that we reduce as much as possible arbitrarily about this study. I want to put your attention on this one. This is the ambient concentration. We do not have measurements. So for this, we have to create a prior. So we couldn't assume any value to be more likely than any other value. So the distribution here used by the model is homogeneous. We set up the hydrology, so as I said, we need to make the model uh, working well in predicting hydrological fluxes, and we achieved that. Maybe the model is missing some of the peaks here, but uh, it's getting very, doing a very good job uh, most of the time. Uh, unfortunately, one of the three catchments, sub-catchments, the body of the small agricultural one, was not performing very well. Uh, so this is given by the Nash sub -clive coefficient, so we were not able to predict uh, the water flows, and that would be a major confounding factor. So we decided to exclude that from the evaluation data set. And we focus on the big catchment, the NRS, and the survey. How did the model work in the calibration? We asked the model to identify the values of the parameter that produce the best estimates of the empirical data of uh, fragments, we focus on fragments for the calibration in this uh, in the in these two catchment left catchment, and the model does a pretty good job. All the prediction are presented with their confidence boundaries, uh, interquartile, median, and 95 percent quantiles. Uh, concerning the stream water concentration, all the empirical data was typically inside the boundary range of the model, and this is a very positive result especially for the big NRS catchment that capture most of the particles uh, uh, emitted in that area. For the small catchment, there was a tendency of overestimating that this may be because uh, we assume the same level of inputs also for the small forest catchment as for the main agricultural catchment uh, as the NRS. For the sediment, uh, also did a good job for the NRS, but uh, we had an overestimation for fragments in the soil location. In any case, I will have an error factor of below 2 for water concentration and below a factor of 8 for sediment concentration, which is in the same range as uh, uncertainty for the measurement. So altogether, this was a positive result. Next, we have now a validated model, and we wanted to challenge this validated, calibrated model, sorry, to predict the concentration of fiber. So an external data set. We put, uh, made the right changes in the parameters to define the information about fibers that has this elongated form, that the shape is one of the factors that affect entrain making water and so on. And we asked the model to to make prediction, and he did very well. So we've seen a kind of performance as done for the calibration data set. 
we guess uh, certainly uh, same water concentration within a factor of two. Sediment concentration a little bit worse within the order of magnitude, but we know that those measurements are also are uncertain. And we also had that this very nasty outlier here was also an outlier for the measurement. Fortunately, the model didn't waste so much that and it keep focus on predicting reasonable, reasonable concentrations. So once we have the calibrated model, we have a predictive tool, it's validated to do prediction, we use the model to assess the mass budgets and the flows of, of particles in this session. So we can calculate the total input from land to the river uh, by year, here on the left side of your screen. Uh, you can see that in average, this catchment, uh, the soil delivers about 2.5 tons per year of microplastic to the river. Uh, while the input from wastewater, we want to compare this runoff to the wastewater. The input is very skewed, but about, about half a ton per year seems to come in average from wastewater. So land uh, runoff is very important. We also look at the time evolution of the land storage of plastic, and you can see the model, of course, where it can increase in the concentration of plastic in so the, the storage, so the total bulk plastic. This is the storage for soil and sediments together that reflects the dynamics of uh, releases when you have a high flow events, like uh, we have a high stream power, a lot of the particles are suddenly washed away from the sediment. And this is the yearly aggregated figure for the catchment uh, release of plastic at the, at the mouth of the river. So you can see that we are releasing a few tons every year in average from, from the river. Okay, at this point we had a question, which might be interesting also for people that are not familiar with models. So can we define a parameter that tells us what is the, how many, okay, how much of the particles are that were given landscape, stay in the landscape over the long time, and how much is released? So we call this index uh, retention efficiency, and it's calculated based on aggregating Flies over multiple years and calculating and, and creating a ratio. So this is expressing percentage. This figure is again a probability distribution tell us that about between 20 and 50 percent. So here yeah, between 20 and 50 percent of the particles added over the multiple years to the catchment tend to remain in the catchment. So there is a big re release of particles. Most of particles are washed downstream, but there is also a bigger tension. We have then made this static mass balance that shows uh, the components. Surprisingly, as I mentioned, the unknown sources, this part to the soil, are bigger than the known sources. This is the sewage sludge. We believe the sewage sludge will be a major source, but what the model says is that we have a very little knowledge of what are the important sources here we are missing. In order to justify the concentration in the river and sediment, you need to have much more plastic added to soil. And we do not know where the particles come from. The soil reservoir, of course, is bigger compared to the, to the sediment reservoir, and we broke down fluxes in this way. And this was my last slide, so thank you very much. I, as a conclusion, the model, this model did a good job, so this tells us that the models can be useful. We need a lot of developments, we need to get into the detail of processes. To do that, we need a more advanced data set. Uh, this, this is necessary, more data. Models totally rely on the availability of good data, including this model, of course. Uh, we managed to produce estimates and predictions that make sense. We calculated this retention efficiency between 20 and 50 percent of particles tend to stay on the landscape. So basically, model are useful assessment tool after we are sure that they are validated, they provide meaningful outputs. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Luca. I think we have time for questions. So. And then maybe I start. So what what I estimate? So you said that the uh, sludge. You assume that it's a big source, but it was not. Can you see what are the big sources in the in the catchment from the model, or is it 
and the model has uh, account for this generic source we call ambient, which uh, should include everything that is not true life. We believe that atmospheric deposition are an important component. And we have a uh, when defining the period, so what is the expected range of this ambient, we take two things of consideration available knowledge of atmospheric deposition from the planet. And certainly atmospheric deposition are more important than what we believe before. The CS large is very rich in particles, but uh, it's a minimal amount of soil territory, so and it's only one story uh, after certain different location. Agricultural plastic, we had no clue what is uh, the component. There is a lot of use of margin in that area, so litter uh, and so on. We know some other sources like car uh, carpi debris are important, but the model did not count because we didn't include in the empirical data. So that is a separate thing. Not a, are not included in those unknown sources. But certainly, we need to be more into assessing sources. I think this is, in my opinion, at this point, there is a major gap. It's the main, most important lesson I learned from the model. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Is the microphone coming? Thank you so much for your very nice presentation. I'm not an expert in modeling. Uh, but I'd like to know if you can give me uh, what's your opinion, which are the most important parameters in the soil in order to be used in the model. Um, uh, for instance, do you think that uh, the aggregates are important, are important parameters to introduce in the model? Okay. Yeah, thank you. This is a very important question. And I... I I don't know if I, I managed to convey this in my presentation, but of course, the model, the solid side of the model is the weakest part of our concept of framework because we do not know much of it. So we have to use these three, three factor infiltration rate, splash detachment, which is related to erosion of soil, and the surface runoff. So basically, uh, any parameter that links to soil erosion must be important. So all the physical structure of soil is clearly important and soil texture, uh, porosity structure. So the management of soil, I'm pretty sure agricultural soil tend to release more plastic than forest soil. They receive more plastic and they also tend to most, most likely release because of the, the way soil, agricultural soil are managed. But uh, if I could uh, give some insights on where sh we should go, we should go towards uh, doing running experiment maybe with the uh, soil course where we are very confident on the structure and characteristic of soil, look how plastic moves through that, and focus on uh, physical interaction, okay? static interaction inside the soil structure, but also chemical interaction. Hydrophobicity must play an important role because soil is a lot of uh, hydrophobic structure and polyethylene is mostly one of the most hydrophobic things I know in my Another question? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, first this question. Thank you very much. Just a question. Do you have an idea of the composition of the nature of the microplastics you found in your samples? Just just to give you an Yes. I'm doing uh, uh, farming at small scale, and what I found is soil after 20 years of non farming and going back is uh, plastics from the surrounding environment, uh, from packaging, from uh, towels that are coming from the houses nearby, and nothing from in the soil itself. So, yeah, yes, we the data, empirical data we had uh, as a definition of the typology by polymer uh, and by size and, and morphology, right? So we could recognize fibers, although we're not the most important component. What we call fragments are basically everything that cannot be classified as fibers, so the variety of uh, morphologies. The most important polymer were polyethylene and polypropylene, which is normal. 
since we are working with microplastic, it's very difficult to link that to the sources. Uh, these are the empirical data here is a few years dating 2016. So there was not much focus on uh, characterizing plastic from mulching human detention. So I cannot tell you if there is uh, something that can be linked to mulching thing, but uh, certainly it was a big heterogeneity in terms of the fragments. Um, of course, we didn't measure soil. We didn't have empirical measurement of soil. We only measured sea sludge, wastewater effluents, river sediments, and uh, stream water. So what we see is not just what comes from soil, it's a combination of the whole thing. Yes, uh, thank you, Luca. Uh, well, um, you mentioned that uh, the retention, well, the first thing that we probably um, we should not consider is uh, calling everything as a plastic disregard of what is the chemistry of that plastic. And you mentioned that uh, the retention of plastic uh, in the model was considered. Uh, we are doing some modeling within the plant and within the soil as well. And we realize that, for example, if you have PVC, the retention of the PPC would be much uh, different than the PS or others. So did the model also consider that the type of plastic would uh, wash faster than the other type? At, than at the moment, uh, the model only considers density and shape and size. Uh, we do not have any equation dealing with uh, the chemistry of particles uh, and the kind of interaction they can have with the uh, soil, for example, components. This is the next level. But for this, we need this uh, focus studies and look at the behavior in soil and control environment. That's very important. So you are the next uh, step for your model, right? Yeah. As soon as we have the data. Right? One more question, okay? Yes, uh, Luca. And so what was the size of particles which you took into your model? In which range? It was uh, the minimum size was 50 micron. As I said, this data is not uh, very new. So, and the upper size was one millimeter. Of course, most of the particles in number was in the smaller scale because of the distribution. We would have time for one last question. Okay. And then if you have more questions, we can also ask yeah. you can yeah. the yeah. coffee break. Hi. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. It's a following question. Uh, because of course you can expect that the, the distribution doesn't start at 50 micrometers, we have more. But do you include that in the model at the moment to kind of extend the size distribution of the new measure or Maybe. Yeah, yeah, the model uh, can potentially do much more. We need to constrain to reduce the, the, the level of detail to fit with the data we get, but the model does uh, uh, arbitrary small particles, of course, when you get in the nanoscale, the physics change, but uh, let's say in the range of microplastic, uh, should work, should, okay? And um, also all the other processes, data aggregation, fragmentation, changes in density due to biofouling are present in the model, but we could not really, for this kind of assessment, of calibration and validation, we didn't have the right data to, to use that. So we use the model in a very you know, impressionistic way. You reduce detail and you leave the, that's how the, the model is actually required this level of simplification. But the model is totally flexible. And I forget to say that the model is available to everyone, there is, um, I can share, uh, I, I forgot to put a link to that, but I can share the information so you can assess the model. The model uh, developed by Magnus Norling includes also a dedicated programming area that helps uh, environmental scientists to put their hands directly on the model without having to know a lot of com computer science. We also have a graphical interface. You can run the model by clicking and putting changing parameters. There is also a demo version available on our website, uh, ecap.org. Uh, you can play with that. Uh, yeah, I hope I'm trying to publish this as soon as we publish. We'll 
you will have all these names. Okay, thank you. Look again.